Top Bird Talk. This piece is taken from EBPOM Chicago. There is a video presentation of this available on EBPOM.org. It is a panel discussion which follows on from a presentation given by Bobby Jean Zweiser. You can see that presentation or listen to it if you check out the show notes for this podcast. Coming up, you're going to hear contributions from Professor Bobby Jean Zweiser, the Associate Chair for Clinical Perioperative Practice, Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. Also, Toby Richards, Professor Anesthesia Teaching and Research Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences Central Clinical School at Monash University. Dr. Uzu Akosha, she's the Assistant Professor for the Department of Anesthesiology at Northwestern University in Chicago. She's also the Medical Director of the Perioptive Clinic at Northwestern Memorial Hospital has authored numerous peer-reviewed publications as well as extracts and book chapters on pre-operative assessment and optimization. We also have Dr. Frank Lochnan, who's a consultant anesthesiologist for Cork University Hospital, is the clinical lead for orthopedic elective and trauma anesthesia and joint clinical lead for pre-operative assessment. He also serves as director for the Regional Anesthesia Fellowship Programme at his institution and is the co-author of textbook peripheral nerve blocks and perioperative pain relief. This piece is chaired by Facey Perilata, obstetrical anesthesiologist at Northwestern University, and Top Med Talk's Sol Aronson, tenured professor at Duke University. I'm going to start with a couple of questions of my own, and also I see uh, engagement from our audience. In terms of the iron infusion, transfusion, and specifically the anemia clinic. You talk about how to set it up and some of the steps to consider in its implementation. The question I have, what happens in the smaller setting? Like at a large academic institution, it's very easy to kind of figure things out, set it up. But if you have a patient that is having surgery in a community hospital in a smaller town, what can be done to improve their perioperative outcome if they have uh, iron deficiency anemia? Thank you for that question, um, because I think that many people think that this is just something for, you know, sort of the bigger academic or tertiary care places or a place with a lot of resources. But, you know, virtually all hospitals have infusion centers. Um, these may be a one room. This may be housed off the emergency department where patients come in to get blood transfusions. They come in to get IV antibiotics when they have chronic you know, osteomyelitis or endocarditis. They come in for just simple IV um, fluid infusions when they have certain kinds of conditions that predispose them to you know, the need for that. And they get chemotherapy. So these infusion centers can absolutely, you can partner with them to provide IV iron. And I talked to a lot of people across the country who have been incredibly creative with the way they, you know, seek out individuals in their hospitals or even some hematologists, oncologists in their offices will be um, set up to be able to start IVs and infuse medications. And so they can infuse these drugs. Neurologists will often be infusing IVIG for patients with myasthenia gravis, or infectious disease doctors are infusing antibiotics for patients. So I think you just have to look for those opportunities. And even, you know, in your own pre-op holding area, many pe uh, people have set up process there. People have given IV iron. I myself have given IV iron in the pre-op holding area right before the patient goes back to the operating room. People give it intraoperatively. I've given IV iron infusions in my PACU before patients leave. Um, we can talk about that a little bit, you know, later around the best timing or if those are, you know, if that's a good idea or not. But I would say that all you really need is an IV and the ability of someone to hang this. Probably a little bit more challenging is, is actually getting these IV iron preparations. And again, you know, you need to partner with pharmacists to do that. But I see this, these becoming more and more commonly used, um, particularly in you know, first world countries and much more easily attainable than in the past. One of the questions from our audience, how long does it take to see a rise in hemoglobin following a 750 milligram dose of ferric carboxymaltose? What rise can be expected following one dose? Well, that depends. It depends on whether the patient is just a pure 
iron deficiency, and they're a healthy person with a good bone marrow. I once had a patient who had a hemoglobin of, I think it was less than eight, and five days later, her hemoglobin was almost 11. You know, she was young and healthy and had dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Most patients will have a, a doubling or tripling of the reticulocyte counts within two to three days of receiving IV iron. Um, and that can be a good measure of, of how they're going to respond because it takes a bit longer for that hemoglobin level to rise. So if they have a robust reticulocyte response, then you know that they're likely going to raise their hemoglobin. So I think if the patient has a lot of chronic disease, they have a lot of inflammation, they have that um, a, you know coexistence of iron deficiency as well as anemia of chronic disease, then their bone marrow is not going to be as responsive, and that may take um, a longer length of time, um, even weeks. And if the patient's bleeding concomitantly, then you're losing blood and losing iron while you're trying to give, you know, iron to raise our hemoglobin. So I think another important point is, is to, you know, address that blood loss. So, you know, many patients can be um, medically managed to decrease blood loss or managed in a less invasive way for certain kinds of bleeding issues so that you can temporize that until you're waiting for the more definitive surgery that the patient's going to have. Thank you. I would like to bring uh, one of our panelists, Dr. Toby Richards. I have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Richards. One of them, coming from your surgical background, how can we obtain buy-in to actually set up uh, the pathway for a pre-anesthetic anemia clinic? And this is out of one of the questions posed by our audience. I think in the preoperative assessment of patients prior to major surgery, we need to look at the whole patient management. And when we're talking about patient blood management, we're looking not just at correcting the number of the hemoglobin, but we're also looking at reducing blood loss and a transfusion strategy. And this goes glove in hand with the overall patient risk. If you have someone who is hypertensive or someone who's an uncontrolled diabetic, you wouldn't rush them to theatre. So if you've got someone who's got uncontrolled hemoglobin, why should it be managed differently? And so I think it's, a, it's an issue of flagging risk to the surgeons. And if the surgeons realise that their patient is at a higher risk, therefore sensible discussions need to be had about the magnitude of the surgery and the timing of the surgery and whether or not you as the anaesthetists are prepared to put this person to sleep as part of the surgical team in that regard. So it's taking a, a slightly more holistic picture of approaching risk and preparation prior to surgery. Another question for you, Dr. Richards, uh, from the audience. In light of the results of the PREVENT trial, is there a role for correcting anemia? Excellent. So look, the PREVENT randomized controlled trial was developed following a series of audits, uh, literature reviews that suggested that intravenous iron was effective to correct hemoglobin. The second set of data was that preoperative anemia is associated with increased risk prior to major surgery. And it's not a dissimilar debate to the uh, aggressive management of glucose in people on intensive care. Does correction of a number or control of a number translate to correction of the risk associated with that number? And so in PREVENT, we randomized people an average of two weeks prior to major abdominal surgery to intravenous iron and placebo. And the leading thought is that this was a great idea. It's going to be highly pragmatic. It will reduce transfusion, make people feel better, and they'll get out of hospital faster with fewer complications. However, the results of the trial were highly conclusive in that the use of intravenous iron made no significant difference to patient outcomes. It did cause a rise in hemoglobin, and that rise in hemoglobin was more in those with a lower ferritin compared to those with, say, for instance, a ferritin over 100. However, that didn't translate into meaningful outcomes for the patient. So the question you've got to ask is, are you correcting a number? or are you correcting a risk? Because it's all very well swapping a, black, a bag of black iron for a bag of red blood. But why bother if it doesn't have a meaningful outcome to the patient? So as a one size fits all, should all people 
who have anemia be assumed to have functional iron deficiency, which is a diagnosis we're not completely au okay fait with, receive intravenous iron? And the answer is no. The, the level one evidence doesn't support that. Now, if you've got someone with a ferritin less than 30, my argument is why aren't you treating this patient anyway, no matter whether or not they've got pre their pre-op or whether or not they're medical, whether or not they're cardiac, whatever. We should be identifying and managing all people with iron deficiency, not just the perioperative ones. The next question really following on to that is the timing of when should you do this? Well, the results of PREVENT are reassuring in the current COVID lockdown. It's not possible to get people into hospital two to four weeks prior to major surgery. It's a risk bringing them in because you're exposing them to infection. The results are therefore reassuring in that we don't, we're not disadvantaging our patients in that regard. The next big question really is, well, if they are iron deficient, should we be treating them at the time of the operation or even post-operatively when it's really easy? Thank you. I would like to bring on Dr. Okosha now. And Dr. Okosha, I'm going to ask for your non-biased opinion. Who should be running the <laughs> anemia clinic? The anesthesiologist. I think we have a good understanding of what transfusion looks like in the OR. We also have a good understanding of the outcomes of transfusion postoperatively, and we appreciate the difference of a patient who's well optimized from an anemia perspective compared to a patient who comes in really anemic. I think that perspective allows us to really manage these patients to the best that they can be to provide the best outcomes. What do you think about the role for postoperative iron infusion? Is there room for that? It's a growing space in our institution. We have started discussions around managing postoperative anemia, understanding that it's almost like the iron deficiency if the initial hemoglobin was normal or somewhat normal. The understanding being that you've lost some blood there's some level of dilution and being able to identify these patients and treat them before they are discharged in the cases where they're admitted allows for, you know, we, we think based on literature, improved outcomes over time, less readmission rates, patients feel better generally speaking. And if they do need surgery in the near future, that they are in the process of getting optimized before coming back. We're not reinventing the wheel by having them come back again and restart the process with a shorter lead time to getting them optimized. I'm going to invite our next panelist, Dr. Lachnan. And one of the questions posed by our audience, is there a medical legal vulnerability to the anesthesiologist in identifying anemia, but not ensuring that the patient uh, does not have an underlying condition? Thoughts there? It was one of the biggest issues for us in deciding whether or not we should even contemplate uh, having an IV iron clinic or an anemia clinic. The question was, if, if you don't follow through, so somebody's anemic and there's an underlying cancer and they slip through the net, um, who's liable for a delayed diagnosis in, in that patient? What we decided that should happen is that we shouldn't delay their surgery in order to pursue investigations, but we should have an extra arm on the pathway that they would be followed up through gastroenterology or with a, an appropriate uh, surgical team to investigate them more fully, but that we don't just treat the anemia, but we actually look for the cause for it. But it initially was a big, big concern. And I have to make a declaration is that we have done our business case and all of that for our uh, anemia clinic. And in the end, we didn't pursue an anemia clinic. So we haven't got quite that far. There's a few other reasons for that, but we decided we'd not pursue it. But it was one of the considerations initially. So let me follow up with another audience question. Where is Ireland in terms of developing this uh, anemia or iron infusion clinics? In Cork, we were at the forefront of developing the clinic. There are some pre-assessment clinics that do treat iron and do some infusions, but it's not a standalone clinic uh, in any hospital that I know of. 
once the PREVENT trial came out, I think a lot of people stepped back from going any further. There are some people still individually treating iron, but as a general service that would be recognized on a national basis, it doesn't exist at the moment. Dr. Schweitzer, I have a question for you. When assessing the benefit of this iron infusion clinics, what is the best outcome to look for? Are we talking about the need for transfusion? Are we talking about hemoglobin levels? Or is there something else that we should be looking into as our primary outcome? I think the primary outcome should be that you're treating a patient with a disease. You know, we wouldn't diagnose hypertension in the pre-op area and simply say, well, you know, the blood pressure is high, but we don't have good evidence that it's high enough to cause a perioperative complication. So therefore we don't think we're going to, you know, we're just gonna ignore this. Um, we're physicians and, and healthcare providers first and foremost. And I think that we spent too much time focusing often on whether this benefits the patient for this perioperative period. Um, I think ideally we would improve outcomes for the perioperative uh, time and encounter. But I think we've identified a patient with an underlying condition and we need to participate in the evaluation and care and treatment of that condition. So I think that that's first and foremost is that you just step up to the plate and um, evaluate the patient's anemia. I do not agree with routinely giving IV iron to all comers who just have anemia. That's the problem with the PREVENT trial. I think it was the design of the trial. I mean, I think, you know, the results are is that we should not do give IV okay. iron to all patients with anemia. I think it's not dissimilar to some of the other trials that have been done, like POIS, where we gave aspirin to people who weren't at risk for vascular events, and we just showed that it didn't benefit those patients. So that's why I you know, focused a lot on evaluating the patient's anemia. I think you can do that really effectively and efficiently. It doesn't cost much money, um, and that is the first and absolute step. And then you do targeted treatment. You don't keep, give chemotherapy to people who don't have cancer. You don't give insulin to people who don't have diabetes. You should not give IV iron to people who don't have a demonstrated need for iron. We can figure out later whether you know, functional iron deficiency exists or doesn't exist. And those patients likely have to be treated with both ESA agents as well as IV iron to show benefits. But I think it's really unfortunate actually that people took away from poise, you know, one, that you don't give beta blockers to people. And poise two, you don't give aspirin to people. And they took away from the prevent triad that you don't give iron to people who have anemia. You have to target the audience. You have to be doing personalized medicine and um, identify the need and then treat appropriately. And then I think, you know, you should pat yourself on the back if you, if you identify a patient who has a treatable iron and you either try to treat them, try to lower their perioperative risk, you, you connect them with other individuals who can carry that torch and, and evaluate them long-term and post-op. And for, you know, elderly individuals, the risk of cancer is incredibly high in somebody who has two iron deficiency anemia. And in fact, often that is the first indication that that patient has something much more serious um, and really requires taking care of that before they have their total joint replacement or their, you know, elective spine surgery, but, you know, making sure that they don't have colon cancer or bladder cancer. Thank you. Dr. Sol Aronson, my co-host. Oh, hi. <laughs> there I am. Um, thanks, Bobby Jean. I think it's an important point just to give some calibration. I, I just want to say, and Toby, I know you want to respond to Bobby Jean. Firstly, clinical research is hard, and, and I respect those who do it well and diligently. And um, I think PREVENT is a, is a great example of, of um, you know, a, a bold and strong effort to perform, you know, clinical research. However, I do think it's important that we um, constructively, uh, you know, accept the, the sometimes limitations of, of um, jumping to conclusions, particularly those that, that potentially could um, influence, if you will, you know, a, a topic as important as, as whether or not we should treat, preventatively treat anemia um, before surgery. I, I do think it's fair to say that there are ever other evidence uh, 
um, that they have suggested, obviously, a reduction in transfusion, which is a really interesting metric because it's it's a it's a it's a human, if you will, trigger. You know, whether or not we decide to transfuse or not is generally something that we we base on um, measuring acute hemoglobin, and so the the actual um, change in hemoglobin as a consequence of treating. Um, preoperative identified, uh, you know, anemia or low hemoglobin um, is something that has a temporal relationship to, and I think we need to speak to to the relationship of that. Uh, but but I think it's also fair to say that there's very interesting evidence um, now that that uh, speaks a little bit differently to length of stay or readmission rate or even cost of care. Um, the group in Australia and, and Axel Hoffman have presented some very nice data to suggest that there might be contrarian, if you will, outcomes to what you found. And I noticed even in your own prevent study that you noticed a trend toward reductions in uh, readmission rates. And so I guess I'd just like to speak to that a little bit more carefully so that we don't jump to a potentially wrong conclusion that treating preoperative anemia has no value. And, and now I'll send it over to you, Dr. Richards, to speak to that. Okay, so there are three points in there. And when answering them, you need to go back to the trial design. When addressing a problem, you have a protocol that is in place to address that problem. And the purpose of a randomized controlled trial is to balance the two populations such that the intervention and the effect of the intervention can be teased out. As Bobby Jean pointed out, it is not normal practice for people to get routine ferritin tests when they present to pre-assessment pre clinic. And that, that was very much the case in the United Kingdom. And so it was not possible uh, to have the inclusion criteria based on ferritin. The second aspect is if you go back to the original data in the Lancet article we published in 2011, that was about the association of anemia and outcomes. It was not about the association of iron deficiency and outcomes. And so the question was about anemia and therefore a potential solution to anemia was addressed in the PREVENT trial. In the PREVENT trial, we took um, core laboratory samples from all patients at randomization and on the day of surgery. Those were analyzed and produced in table two. Uh, analysis of the primary endpoints of PREVENT by baseline ferritin, i.e. a ferritin less than 100, uh, had absolutely no impact on the trial results. If you look at the correspondence in the Lancet article, we produced a supplementary table where we put the baseline ferritin levels in of less than 30, less than 100, or TSATs less than 20% and ferritin less than 100. That represents 82% of the entire population of PREVENT, and it makes, unfortunately, no meaningful difference to the outcome of the trial. So if you take the PREVENT trial, 487 patients, and you include the 400 odd with the normal uh, accepted definition of iron deficiency anemia, the use of intravenous iron showed no benefit in the perioperative period to that effect. So that's the iron deficiency question. And we've got more data coming out about that where we've looked at baseline ferritin, hepcidin levels, Thomas plot analysis, erythroferrin, et cetera. Work in progress at the moment. So the data are the data. And I'm sorry that it's not the data we want, the answer we wanted, but that's why you do the trial. Now, the second question was um, the data from Australia, where I currently work. Now, it's important, as with all data, you look at quality of data. There is no doubt there has been an incredible trend in the last 10 years in Western Australia to reduce transfusion rates. And that a multitude of different interventions take place. One thing that is startling here in Western Australia is the use of intravenous iron in the community, particularly in women's health. So we do random testing. So we set up clinics and do finger prick testing all over the place as part of some of my PhD work. And so we tested one and a half thousand students on the open day at the university, the female students. 
Eighteen percent of the female medical, or the female students, medical students, and other had had an iron infusion. That is unprecedented in the rest of the world. Um, when we did the same in the United Kingdom, it was about one point eight percent. So you're looking at intravenous iron is incredibly common in the community. So baseline anemia is quite rare coming into hospital now compared to ten years ago. And transfusion is incredibly uh, unusual in hospitals. So there's no doubt that in the decade of practice and also the transition from one hospital to a brand new hospital, that there has been improvements in outcomes. But it's important to realize that's associative data and not level one evidence. Your third point, which is the point that many people have missed which I think is perhaps the most exciting outcome of PREVENT, is that in those people who received intravenous iron, there was no change to the in-hospital or 30-day outcome of those patients. However, there was a marked reduction in readmission rates to hospital for those people who had intravenous iron. And this was associated with a higher hemoglobin at eight weeks after uh, randomization. Now, we're back where we were in 2011, except where we, we've effectively got a pilot study. If you go into large databases from the Mayo, from the Cleveland, uh, from the Kaiser database, um, there is an association with increasing trend to discharge people from hospital with a lower hemoglobin in 2020 compared to uh, 2010. And there is association with discharge hemoglobin and readmissions to ICU and readmissions to hospital. So very, very similar to our 2011 manuscript in the Lancet, where we showed that preoperative anemia was associated with um, increased adverse events in the perioperative period. So I think there's a suggestion there. I think it's a very sensible hypothesis. I think it needs to be tested in a randomized controlled trial. Um, because if there's one thing we have learned from PREVENT is that a great idea, no matter how plausible it is, doesn't necessarily translate into patient outcomes. And so therefore I urge everyone that when you're thinking about a new intervention, always test it before you implement it. Because uh, as it turns out, we might have been wrong about the preoperative intravenous iron use. Thank you, Dr. Richards. I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Bobby Jean final thoughts or comments about this particular question. Yes, I mean, thank you, Dr. Richards, for those comments and also for all the work that you've done in this space. And I agree, it's really tough to do clinical trials. You know, but I think that, you know, that point about the readmission rates is so important because I think it also dovetails with the timing that we would expect, particularly in a patient who now is having surgery. And many of those patients in your trial, you know, almost certainly had coexisting anemia of chronic disease along with even the ones who had anemia of iron deficiency, particularly when you were looking at cutoffs of ferritins of 100, because between 30 and 100 is at somewhat controversial. These weren't patients who met the criteria for absolute iron deficiency anemia. Um, and it takes them longer to increase their hemoglobin. So if you're looking at things like decreased transfusion rates, you're not going to see that when you're giving people iron a few days before their surgeries. So sometimes that's necessary, right? They're time sensitive surgeries and emergency surgeries. But that's not very often. I think just because we have used surgery as this, you know, like we only have a short period of time between when we see them pre op and when they have surgery, or we think that surgery cannot be delayed. There are so many studies outside of the iron deficiency world um, and surgery showing that patients who have many conditions, they're better off for you to preoperatively manage those conditions, improve those conditions before undergoing surgeries um, that impact outcomes at 30 days, impact outcomes at a year. And I truly believe that this is where we need to look at this, this issue is how early in the process do we really need to give people IV iron? And then how far do we follow them out to see the benefits of that? both in the benefits for the surgery itself, as well as the long-term benefits. You know, I think that, again, I emphasize what I said earlier, 
when we engage people preoperatively who have un previously undiagnosed or untreated conditions, be that hypertension, diabetes, or any other condition, we have an obligation to now engage that treat patient and either treat them ourselves or pass those patients off in the right way so that they get good care for long term, regardless of whether that those benefits that benefits surgery or not. But many of these things, it's a matter of timing. If we see the patient soon enough and we should work on doing that and giving them appropriate treatment soon enough, we are much more likely to see those benefits in the perioperative period. Thank you both. We're gonna shift gears a little bit. One of the audience members asked about hypophosphatemia after IVR in administration and the small number of patients where this can persist for months or longer. Any experience with this? Any comments, Dr. Richards? I'm going to go with the good news about PREVENT. So look, we've looked at this and there are two really important studies out there at the moment. One is a study by St. Rain Parisha from the WEHI in Melbourne, where they looked at the instance of hypophosphatemia. And it's really important you don't confuse this with post-infusion flu or mild hypersensitivity reactions. And they showed that there was no correlation between serum phosphate levels in the post-infusion period and any symptomatology reported by patients. In the set setting of the PREVENT trial, and this is work in progress, uh, unpublished, um, we measured serum phosphate. Very interestingly, in the control group, serum phosphate falls preoperatively, and that maybe that's because patients are starved. However, in response to oncoboximaltose, there's a significant fall in serum phosphate, quite markedly so. And around about 15 to 20% of those people in the intervention arm had clinical hypophosphatemia when they went for surgery. Now, as you're well aware, the results of the PREVENT trial showed absolutely no difference whatsoever in any reported adverse event, serious adverse event, SUSAR, complication, length of stay, intensive care whatsoever. So do I think it's clinically relevant? No, I do not. Um, have I given lots of, I've given over 3000 doses of oncoboximaltose myself, never really seen a problem. And if you look at the data, there's a very nice uh, summary from Miles Wolf and um, his team published two days ago. The average dosing of oncoboximaltose in those patients who've reported significant adverse events is seven grams. So I think it's a laboratory phenomena. Uh, and my personal opinion is I don't measure phosphate levels and I don't think it's a clinical concern. I think that, uh, you know, the PREVENT trial uh, likely was not powered to be able to detect all adverse events, particularly hypophosphatemia. I sort of moderate that a little bit. I think that if you have a patient with malabsorption, particularly a patient with inflammatory bowel disease, and I think that this likely is probably an increased risk of hypophosphatemia. And I think one should be a bit cautious. I don't recommend routinely monitoring phosphate levels post-op or post-infusion. Um, I don't know if Dr. Kocha wants to remark on this, but we developed a, a guide, a, a, just a little sheet uh, for patients that we gave them after a uh, discharge from an infusion of ferricoboxymaltose, which seems to be the highest risk is with that compound, though all iron compounds uh, potentially have this risk of just encouraging them to eat some high phosphate foods. And we listed some high phosphate foods for them. So I do think if you have a patient with malabsorption, chronic inflammatory bowel disease, or, or a patient who is you know, significantly underweight or malnourished, that you may actually have a small risk of hypophosphatemia. Dr. Okosha? So yes, we, at our institution, we've given close to 6,000 plus doses of ferricoboximaltose, and to date, none have been reported to have any clinically significant symptoms. And we do provide patients with a handout that encourage eating phosphorus-rich foods if they experience any symptoms, and no issues to date. Another question I have uh, for Dr. Okosha, pregnancy. Is it a contraindication for iron infusion? It is not. We, in our institution, we have a large um, obstetric population that comes through our anemia clinic. Um, 
we usually see these patients in their second trimester. And these are typically patients who have failed oral iron first trimester for the most part. And these patients do not need fetal monitoring for their iron infusions. They don't need any special treatment for receiving their iron infusion. In fact, we have looked at some of their data and it's quite promising that these patients do quite well in response to IV iron. They typically by their third trimester are you know, close to having normal hemoglobins, if not normal. Dr. Schweitzer, if a patient has end-stage renal disease and they are undergoing hemodialysis, do we have to do anything different for them? Do we adjust dosing, timing? Um, can you help us with this question? Um, likely not if they're actually undergoing hemodialysis because uh, typically, at least um, in most uh, developed countries, they routinely have their hemoglobins monitored and they get receive IV iron and erythropoietin on a regular basis. I think it's actually a perfect example of some of an issue where if you pay people to do the right thing, they will do the right thing. So in the United States, everybody who's on dialysis is covered by the Medicare, the government insurance, CMS, automatically. And CMS, many years ago, decided that they were going to pay people to maintain people with iron, with a, on dialysis to have hemoglobins between 9 and 11. And they would not pay for erythrocyte stimulating agents for hemoglobin levels greater than 11 after a single study came out in the literature showing increased in, um, uh, vascular events in patients who are maintained with dialysis who have hemoglobins greater than 11. So I always say that if you have a pa patient on dialysis who's not acutely bleeding, you can be assured that their hemoglobin is going to be between 9 and 11 because these dialysis centers get paid money to keep it there and they will do that. Um, you occasionally run into patients who are on home dialysis or peritoneal dialysis who don't you know, get their regular um, erythrocyte uh, stimulating agents and iron deficiency. Uh, but otherwise, I would just say be cautious of not having too high of hemoglobins in patients with uh, on dialysis because it has been demonstrated that hemoglobin levels greater than 11 are associated with increased vascular events just long term, not necessarily increased vascular events. And I don't think that study has been done in the perioperative period. Um, so occasionally we'll have a you know, job with a witness who has uh, on dialysis. And in those situations, we do. Um, momentarily or for a short period may advocate getting their hemoglobins higher than 11 to allow them to have a buffer if they're undergoing major surgery with, with effective blood loss. But otherwise, you need to ex sort of accept um, a different hemoglobin level as being the ideal hemoglobin level for a patient on dialysis. Dr. Lochnan, you mentioned that you were in the process or previously in the process of starting a are an infusion clinic. Can you tell us more about the local limitations, practical limitations to getting this off the ground? What has been your experience? I think as alluded to earlier, we do have an IV infusion clinic, a standalone clinic that accepts from all disciplines. So they, okay. um, so extra staff would have been the first thing that we would have required for that but when we did our business case actually simply the reduction in transfusion alone would have paid for that so just the costs in saving on blood products would have been enough to pay for the staff in order to to augment the staff that had already already existed in the IV infusion uh, clinic um, and then it wouldn't have been terribly difficult to get it up and running. It would have come through the pre-assessment, anesthesia pre-assessment clinic. Um, there would have been an algorithm. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a full document or business case, so there's an algorithm to follow for uh, each patient. Um, and um, so calculating the doses of IVR was pretty much automatic. Um, and um, so it's, it's more a will and uh, and uh, whether we should or not. There was a discussion around whether it should be an anaesthetist or the primary surgical teams looking after it, but practically speaking, we've got so many 
specialties to deal with. The one centre point that they all link through is a pre-assessment clinic or an anaesthetic clinic and that's, that is the practical place to do it even though it doesn't sit well with all of my colleagues but it's um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that just makes sense. The question was hanging in the air about whether correcting the anemia would have the benefits that or would um, uh, contract the, um, the problems with anemia in the pre-op. You know, so the complication rates from anemia. So whether correcting it would be the solution and giving IV iron would be the solution. And so we pretty much held out until the PREVENT trial came out because we knew it was in the offing and we were waiting and waiting a little bit. I guess it's given people uh, pause for thought really, you know. So it, do it doesn't mean that uh, IV iron doesn't have a place. I think, a, a, let's say a more honest discussion could be had just around transfusion and say, you know, so talk to our blood transfusion service and say, you know, is this a good risk benefit um, uh, equation that we should be looking at as give people iron, reduce their transfusion levels, save on blood costs, be honest with the patients that this is what we're doing um, and the, we don't have the evidence to say it'll improve your surgical outcome as such. And I think that would be a reasonably honest uh, discussion going forward. Um, and then the other thing that we should probably consider is uh, IV iron in the post-op period. Um, and we should look at it and we're kind of waiting for, um, I guess we'll, we'll just have to spend more time thinking about that. But I think there is room there in the future that um, as they leave the OR, the OR, they could get a prescription for IV iron and, um, because they're not going to absorb iron in the post-op period. So for quite a few weeks, it may, if nothing else, if nothing else, make them feel better for a few weeks afterwards. And if we're lucky, it'll reduce our readmission rates and our uh, complication rates and our length of stays. But um, I guess that's kind of where we're looking at. But the day-to-day -day setup of the clinic, um, it's not, it's not a huge thing really. It's um, you measure the bloods, you decide whether you're going to treat it or not, and you send them with a prescription down to the infusion clinic. That's, those are the practicalities for us of, of, of doing it. One, one of the things, okay. um, if I may interject, uh, Facey, that I think is important for us to consider in this discussion is how long it takes for there to be an observed change in hemoglobin when you make a decision to initiate IV iron therapy. Um, it's not instantaneous. And I think it's an important metric because so many of our triggers to behave in a certain way in the immediate acute perioperative space um, to make the decision to transfuse or not, which is a behavior. It's not, you know, anything other than sort of a behavior to make that decision um, is, is predicated on measuring hemoglobin. We, we are just clinicians who do the best we can, and we make decisions and judgments often by measuring hemoglobin. And when it's below whatever our tolerance is, we, we have an inclination to treat it. And if it's above what our tolerance is, we have an inclination to not treat it. So the question that I practically would put to us is, how long does it take when we preoperatively decide to um, give IV iron or therapy to increase hemoglobin because we think that's important for that change to occur. And I think it takes two to three weeks. And so if, if we're not giving ourselves enough runway preoperatively to see the effect of what we purport to do for whatever good cause, I, I think we're tripping, you know, at the starting line before the gun goes off. And I think that's an important variable that has to be shared and considered in this discussion. So if I can come back to you, Sol, I completely agree. But the aspects of mechanism are, more, are also important. In the preoperative setting, the majority of our deficiency is probably driven by inflammation and chronic disease. Um, whereas in the postoperative period, after blood loss, you've got blood loss um, trigger for erythrogenesis. And the two are very separate mechanisms. In the preoperative period, um, I mean, PREVENT was an average of two to three weeks prior to uh, surgery. The results are the results. And it, the efficacy of the intervention to correct hemoglobin 
was related to baseline serum ferritin level in that setting. Now, you probably, as you rightly say, you will get around about two thirds of the hemoglobin response within about two weeks in that setting. Now in the post-operative setting, when we looked at the Ironman trial, uh, where Ed Litton was the chief investigator, um, he randomized people on intensive care to intravenous iron or placebo. The efficacy of the response was actually much greater post-operatively with an average response of about 11 grams per deciliter, uh, 11 grams per liter um, within 30 days. So I, I don't think it's so much the timing I think it's the mechanism by which you have the iron sequestration or the iron deficiency or the anemia. And we need to pay closer attention to exactly what those definitions are um, to define our intervention in that setting. There, and I don't think it's um, mutually exclusive. I think they're uh, both important considerations in the overarching uh, treatment. Um, and, and I would add, without throwing more salt into the wound, Toby, that um, if, if there's a definite definition or diagnosis of iron deficient anemia preoperatively, the, the response to IV iron is going to be greater. And I think the one thing we've also learned from PREVENT is our hypothesis of the definition of functional iron deficiency hasn't held up. And we need to go back to work out what our deficiency really is? What should we be really measuring in this setting? I just want to say thank you, all of you, for the rich discussion. Um, I like that the idea that we have to go back and there's still so much more to, that needs to be learned. Um, we could continue this session for another hour, but I think that we need to move on to another session. Again, thank you to our audience for the questions posted and to the panelists for this rich and professional discussion top mid talk thanks for downloading top mid talk don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher don't forget to check us out on social media we're on twitter facebook linkedin and youtube and also don't forget top med talk is the broadcasting arm of edpom evidence-based perioptive medicine we'd love you to find out more about that if you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.